The Pre-Med Year, session number 311. Hello and welcome to the three-time Academy Award-nominated podcast, The Pre-Med Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. A welcome to the pre-med years. Thank you for taking some time out of your day to listen or time during your day. So you're really, listening doesn't really take it out of your day. You're doing the dishes, you're driving to school, you're driving to work, you're exercising, whatever you're doing right now. Thank you for doing it and listening to the pre-med years. I'm excited that you are here. If you don't subscribe to the podcast, whether in Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you were just listening to this on a website, go and subscribe. It's free. It's easy. All the buttons are right there on the blog posts that you're on if you're listening on the website. So today we have a great guest, Janice Stott from Exam Cracker, somebody who's been in the MCAT game for about a decade now. And she is bringing her experience talking to pre-med students every day about the MCAT and their struggles. And we're going to talk about the misconceptions that students have with the MCAT and MCAT prep. And we're going to have a great conversation and we're going to talk about a new service that Exam Crackers is offering, something for students who need a little bit of extra tutoring. It's a service that you can call four nights a week for two hours for a pretty low fee. We'll talk about all that at the end, and I'll even have a coupon code for you to use at the end to save $10 on the service. So let's go ahead and say hello to Janice from Exam Crackers. Janice, welcome to the pre-med years. Thanks for joining me. How are you doing today? I am really well, really excited to be here. Thank you so much. I know we've we've, uh, played a little bit of tag back and forth through email about getting you on the show. And we finally connected at a conference, which if you're listening to this, and you haven't been to a pre-med conference, you should go. Uh, But that's where we finally got to meet in person. And we talked and we're like, let's get you on the podcast. So here you are. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a that was a pretty crazy one out in uh, Davis. Yeah, like you said, if you haven't been to that, and you can get to California. It's a it's a pretty amazing event. It is amazing, and the networking is amazing, and and just kind of a a random tangent, um, a student who I've been working with through this application cycle, she hasn't been getting any interviews, and she's got a low MCAT score, and I said, you need to come out to Davis. If you can come out, and this was like four days before the conference, I was like, if you can make it out to Davis, get in front of these schools and these people and network and show them your face and talk to them and, and advocate for yourself. So she went out to Davis, she talked made a lot of good contacts. And then she went to a double AMC meeting this past weekend and met even more contacts. And people were opening up her application right there on the spot. And and two days later, she got her first interview from one of those schools. That's so, amazing. Good for her. Advocating good for, her. for yourself and networking. It's huge. So who is Janice Stott from Exam Crackers? I am... The National Program Director for Exam Crackers, I have worked with them for going on just over 10 years now, so I know just a little bit about the company, Um, but uh, as a company, we are obviously MCAT Prep, which is why we're here to kind of chat with you today, but myself, I am uh, a semi, I call, I say semi guru on the MCAT. I only say semi because I'm not going to teach you physics or chemistry. Um, you don't want me to, it would not be a very, uh, (laughs) rewarding experience, but, uh, when it comes to absolutely anything else about the MCAT and getting you prepped and ready to go and what you're struggling with and how I can help, um, how we can help that is 100% what I am here for. And it's, uh, phenomenal company to work for. It's a small company and still very, very personable, both internally and externally. Um, We're proud to say that we know all of our students. They're not just numbers um, and we intend to keep it that way. And uh, yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm I'm a mother of two, uh, a devoted wife, but 
from nine to six every day. I'm working with MCAT students, getting everybody ready to go. Most people who I talk to who are in this MCAT prep world were former pre-meds or former professional school, something pre-professional, and found out they really loved test prep and then, and then diverted into this. How did you stumble into the test prep world? Absolutely. So I'm going to be what's called a non-traditional. <laughs> <laughs> I came into the test prep world completely accidentally. I fell into a hole, um, but I absolutely love it. I actually, uh, if we're going to get super personal and I don't mind it, I was actually a musical theater major in college. My dream was to be on Broadway and that did not occur. Um, I like to think not because of talent, but because of timing, but it did not occur. <laughs> and when I headed back out into the real world, I worked with another corporate company for a while. Um, and when that job ended, I, I, I found exam crackers. And I've always been someone who has loved communication and loved talking with students and working with students. Um, and of course, this job gives me Every bit of that, every single day, um, helping to troubleshoot and and manage um, concerns and issues. Um, I, I like to think if maybe I hadn't fallen into this one, I probably would have fallen into advising somewhere because it's just such a really great fit for me. Um, but again, over the course of uh, ten years with the company and many changes to the MCAT along the way, uh, I have. I have learned the ins and outs of being um, a pre-med student, and I have the utmost respect for pre-med students because although it was not my path, um, I, will, I, am, I am never hesitant to say it was much more difficult than my path, and my hat is off to you as a pre-med student uh, with the, the struggles and uh, also the successes that you face along the way. Yeah. So... 10 years, almost 10 years with the company doing MCAT related fun. You've, I'm sure, seen a lot of the misconceptions that come from the students, students who are reaching out to exam yeah. crackers and, and, and talking about the MCAT. And you're like, where did you hear this? Like, uh, how do you, why do you think that? And so that's what I want to cover right. today. Some of these top misconceptions that students have when it comes to the MCAT. So hopefully, Everybody that's listening will avoid those things and start off um, on on a good foot with MCAT prep. So when you're looking at kind of your history, dealing with students and listening to what they're saying and talking to the other kind of tutors and advisors with the company and what they're saying and, and telling you that students are talking about, what what is kind of the, the most common misconception out there with the MCAT? Uh, well, I would say right at the top of the list, right way up at the top is either that I don't need to prep or I feel as though the material I've gotten through my education, my college education has already prepped me for this exam. I, and I, my, the, the hairs on my, <laughs> on my arms stand up whenever a student mentions that to me, because I, I, I feel for them because Yes, you've had an excellent education. Well, I hope, you know, depending on what school you went to, you've had an excellent education. Um, but this test, if that's if that's the feeling that you've gotten, if that's the impression that you've gotten from someone along the way, um, you're going to get hit pretty hard by the MCAT pretty fast when you try to take it. Not, not actually getting yourself familiarized with the actual exam itself and what this crazy critical thinking exam is is all about and how to approach it. Um, it's, it's such a misconception to feel like I don't need to do anything. Let me just jump in and take it and see how I can do. Number one, I don't think any of us want a bad mark on our transcript, on our application. And while you can have more than one MCAT score, why? Why would you do that to yourself? You should only have one. Um, <laughs> it's and, it's not know, even no. it's not even having multiple exams on the on your application. It's why would you put yourself through that test again? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. Why Why would you even do it to yourself? Yeah. Exactly. You know. And and then on on top of that, if you do go in and take it, this and this is what I always try to explain to students: if you do go in and take it, and you have that feeling while you're taking it that oh, this is not going well, and you avoid it. Okay, so the worst case scenario is you've wasted a little bit of money. 
because you voided it. But the worst part about voiding a score is that you never know how you did. It's mm-hmm. just this infinite question mark of was it okay or wasn't it okay? And you'll never know because they're not going to tell you. You voided out your score. Um, it's so any way you look at it, if you haven't if you haven't gotten yourself to the point that you feel prepped and ready to go for this exam and you know what you're about to tackle, you are not in a good spot to take it. It's just, it's not going to, it's not going to be good. I wish they would tell you your score. Like you, you voided, but here's the score you would have gotten just to give some confidence maybe to some of these students who who are lacking confidence or like, I'm doing terrible. I'm doing terrible. I'm doing terrible. Oh, I would have gotten a 505. I guess it's not that terrible. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I will uh, plead guilty. I don't think I've ever asked the AAMC at any event why they don't give mm-hmm. it to you. Um, maybe they just want to be shady like that. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's just, to me, it's like the ultimate cruelty if you, because you, you, you don't, you just have this, okay, I, I, I walked away and I know I'm going to walk away, but yeah. you never really know how you did. Now, do you think students are, are actively thinking or telling themselves, I don't need to prep for the MCAT? Or do you think they, they're they naive about it and, and don't understand that they need to prep, uh, thinking that, oh, I, I'm, I'm doing well in my classes, I'm a good test taker, I've done well on the SAT, ACT, I, I'm going to do fine on the MCAT, so it's just another test? Yeah, I, it's the latter. I, I, I think more than more often than not, it's the latter. It's a, it's a naivete about what this exam is actually going to ask from them. And, you know, it's not necessarily even their fault uh, as a pre-med student. You know, we, we, as students nowadays, we come up through an educational system where we're, you're standardized testing from the time that you're, what, third grade, fourth grade? I mean, you're already in, in the thick of it with standardized testing. And we follow this pattern all the way up through college of, standardized testing and you're rewarded for sight words, you're rewarded for speed reading, you're rewarded for keyword reading, uh, for trying to predict what the answers are going to be or what the questions are going to be, excuse me. There's, there's this pattern that we follow um, and especially as, as science majors and depending on what college you go to, it just continues. And there, I think there is sometimes an overall feeling of, oh, well, I'm a good test taker. So because I'm a good test taker, I'll be fine. I know my concepts. I'll, I'll be fine. The problem is the MCAT decides to take everything that you've learned about standardized testing and flip it on its head <laughs> and tell you, no, you're not going to be fine. Um, it's not about speed reading. It's not about reading for keywords. It's about reading for content and reading for the main idea. And what is this person trying to tell you? And, and a very interdisciplinary approach, which can be extremely confusing for students a lot of times who are like who like to stay in one lane. And let's talk about physics, but let's not broach out and talk about physics and biology together. Let's just stick to physics. You know, it's it's those, it's learning those skills of the interdisciplinary science together, the the overall critical thinking side of the exam, and basic reading comprehension, which unfortunately a lot of students have sometimes lost by the time they hit you know, standard time to take the MCAT as well. It's you got to rewind back a little bit and just remind yourself how to read. What's the main idea? Who wrote it? Why'd they write it? You know, what's the process? So I I think it's a naivete more than anything. Now, a student listening to this is thinking, okay, Janice with exam crackers is saying, obviously the first thing she says is that you need to prep because she works for a test prep company. But what you're saying is you don't need... (laughs) to work with a test prep company, you're just saying you need to prep for the MCAT specifically. I well, correct. I'm definitely saying you need to prep. Now, obviously (laughs) I work for exam crackers. I'm going to tell you, you need to prep with exam crackers, but here's the thing. My job at exam crackers, and I talk to students every day, all day long, consultations all day long. And guess what? Not all of them work with exam crackers and that is perfectly fine. But making sure that students understand what it is they're up against and what it is that they or or how to best get through the exam and come out with the score that they're looking for is really more how I view my job. Yes, I work for exam crackers. Yes, I want you to prep with us. But ultimately, I want you to get the best score that you're looking for, that you're trying to achieve. I want you to get into medical school. So any advice I can give to any student about how to do that is 
to me is, is good advice, regardless of whether they become an EK student or not. Um, but you definitely have to prep for the exam. This is not something you want to walk in cold. We talked about that. This is not something that you want to think I'm good. Um, if nothing else, you want to get yourself on, get your hands on some prep materials Mm -hmm. at your advisor's office, do your research on the AAMC's website, grab a couple practice exams. I mean, that that's baseline. That's, that's without even kind of really getting into actually prepping. Um, but you do, you do want to do your research figure out how you want to tackle this exam and then set aside some good solid time to prep for it. Absolutely. Do you know if the AMC, I know they have some data on it's like 50% of students who take the MCAT have taken some sort of formal MCAT prep course or, or tutoring or whatever. Do you know if the AMC has any data on what the average number of Um, full-length exams that a student takes or if there are students out there like what percentage of students never take a full length because I'm sure it's a very large percentage I don't know if the AAMC has any yeah I'm sure the percent well I know that there's a large percentage because I've talked to a lot of them um you know (laughs) after they they come with a bad score yeah exactly when they're like it didn't do so hot and then it's like well how many practice exams did you take none okay well let's talk about that (laughs) for a hot second um yeah I don't know if they have any data on it Specifically, I haven't seen it, but uh, it that that if it, that shouldn't even be a thought. This is this is an exam like no other exam that you've taken. We kind of already talked about that a little bit. You have to yeah. practice. Yeah. If nothing else, at seven and a half hours, mm-hmm. you have to practice what it's going to feel like to sit there for seven. <laughs> What's and a half your butt going to feel like? Ex- well, you <laughs> laugh, but yep. that is absolutely true. When, yep. you know, when are your, when are your, when's your back going to start to hurt? When are you going to get hungry? When are you going to have to go to the bathroom? Yeah. Well, you know, all of those nuances are things that can psychologically distract you yeah. during exam day. And if you haven't realized that all that's going to come at you in some way, shape or form, that could be two, three, four, five, six points off your score that didn't need to go anywhere just from psychological misunderstanding. So that's one side of it. The other side is you've got to, you've got to practice the exam for comfort of the way the questions are going to be put in front of you. Um, In our opinion at exam crackers, the way we put our books together, the way that we deliver material to you as a student, whether you're in our class or whether you're studying on your own is all about practice. I mean, we're, we're reviewing the concepts because you have to, obviously, But practice is an everyday part of what we do, because for us, that's how we get students to the scores they're looking for. We're having you practice MCAT from day one. It's not it's not three months of let's study concepts and then let's jump into some practice exams. It's day one. You're doing a practice exam. As soon as you go through a lecture, you're practicing MCAT questions. That that practice is it's it's key. It's huge. And the full length have their own. um, reason like we just talked about but a funny little anecdote I'll tell you with our class we do five full length practice exams with our course one's right at the very beginning it's a it's a it's a baseline students never argue with that one ever they're happy to take that one you get to and then we do one every two weeks of the class you get to the second one inevitably the majority of the students don't want to take it and they, they want to hoard it. They want to hold on to it. The third one, they want to hoard, hoard it even more. And, and when we have to push them and say, don't take it, <laughs> you have to take it. You have to practice every two weeks. No, you're not ready. No, you're not going to score the way you want to, but it is that constant steady practice. That's going to get you to the score that you're looking for. So it's that practice exams are huge, huge. They're, huge. Yeah. they're hoarding. They, they don't want to take it because the the bruise to their ego of not scoring what they want because it's like well I still have content to learn so why would I take it is that what they're exactly yeah. that uh-huh. right that right that's ex- that's exactly right if yeah you could have just been a quote from one of our <laughs> our standard students absolutely yep. and you know as soon as we can have the conversation with them and say yes you're not going to score the way you want to so go ahead and don't worry about that go ahead and accept that but understand that the actual art and practice of taking the exam and understanding how you're going to be, how questions are going to be presented to you and how, how you're going to go through three or four answers and determine out of two of them, which is the best. And that just that practice of the actual exam itself is, I wouldn't say equal to 
the concept, but it is a big part. It's it's a good third of your exam, just really understanding that that's that critical thinking side of the exam. And, and you have to learn it. If you don't, the majority of students who don't learn the critical thinking side sit right at 500, either right at or right under. And mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it's a true predictor every time. Anytime I have a student call me and they're like, I'm sitting at 498. It's that the red flag goes up that they probably know their concepts really well, but they don't know the exam and yeah. they don't understand the critical thinking side of the exam. Okay. All right. So that's, that's a big one, right? Prep for it. Mm-hmm. What's, what's another misconception that you see? A big one would be timeline talking about kind of when to take it. And I, I think this may have eased itself just a little bit since the, you know, quote unquote, change to the MCAT, which I think for most students now, most of them don't even know that an old MCAT ever used to exist. (laughs) But, but you don't ever want to feel like you have to take it when everyone else is taking it. So I know for a lot of pre-med students, it's that, okay, I'm on my track, I'm chugging along, I'm chugging along, and I'm going to take my MCAT spring of my junior year, chug, 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 chug. But if you're not ready to take it spring of your junior year, or if you happen to have a really heavy semester where you don't have the time to devote to doing your courses as well as doing your prep, and and that means you need to prep over the summer because you've just got more time available to you, you need to make sure that you're taking this exam when you're ready to take it, not just when someone else tells you you should be taking it. Um, and, And I know for some, that can be a little bit disheartening. Um, you know, as pre-med students, most are very, very devoted. And they're, like I said, they're on kind of this track and it's, I want to get to my senior year and then I want to immediately matriculate on to medical school. But a gap year isn't the end of the world. It's a year. It's, it's a little bit of time to breathe, to do something for yourself before you get back into school, which you're going to be in for a long time. If you do wind up in medical school, or I should say when you do, wind up in medical school. So it's, it's definitely something you want to make sure you're, you're taking it when you're ready. We talked before, there's no reason to have more than one score when you go in for applications. If you have to, you can, but there's no reason for it. Um, and you want to make sure that, that you're taking it when you're ready to take it. And if that means that you need an extra semester to get it done, all right, you need an extra semester to get it done. That everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. And and the world will keep turning and medical school will still be there for you to apply. It's not going anywhere. And there's, I'll, I'll put an asterisk on that because what a lot of students, they'll, they'll hear that and they'll go, okay, so when I'm applying, I can take the MCAT in, in October and apply to medical school still. And then I'm like, well, wait, no, no, no. You have to make sure with the application timeline and applying early and what those deadlines are and everything else. And so there's True. there's this balance of can I still take it this year when I'm ready and apply or should I wait to push my application forward until next year because the later that I take my MCAT it 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 worsens my chances of getting an acceptance because I'm applying late etc. Right. Right. And so all that comes down to making sure that you are looking at your own personal timeline in advance. So don't wait until, you know, your your junior year to talk to your advisor about what prereqs you have left and then expect that you're going to be able to do, you know, uh, Chem 2, Orgo 2, Physics 2 and, you know, Biochem 1 which by the spring of your junior year and take your MCAT at the same time. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have to have a realistic outlook on when everything is going to get done. And then, like I said, from your own personal schedule standpoint, when you are going to have the time to put in to prepping for the exam, because you, you, although you may say, you know, I'll have, uh, I'll be able to prep in the spring. I'll have all my prereqs done. That's fine. Unless you have a really heavy course load. And if you have a super heavy course load, maybe you won't have time to prep or you won't have quality time to prep, which is just as important. If you you have time, but you can't focus, then you're really, it's, it's not time. It's just, it's wasted study time. And I think we've all learned that at some point uh, in our college career, that if your, if your study time isn't quality, it's not doing you any favors. As we're recording this, it's beginning of November, MCAT registration recently opened up for 2019. And so 
now students are are hearing, well, Dr. Gray says in his podcast, try to take it March or April of the year that you're applying so that you have your score back and, and you can submit early. But now Janice is saying, and, and I say as well, you still need to take the test when you're ready. And so they're also hearing that you need to register for the exam because test centers have limited seats. And so now it's like, <laughs> right, the I need to I need to apply early. I need to register for the MCAT early. I need to take the test when I'm ready. I need to take the test in time to apply early. When are they supposed to to figure out when to actually register for the exam? If right. if quote unquote being ready for it, how do how do they know that? Planning, plan, you know, if you, if you ultimately want to check all of the boxes, and I, I will say, Ryan, I I do agree with you completely in the sense that early application is a stronger application, and that does require early planning on a student's part. They have to know, okay, I'm I'm going to make sure that I'm setting aside this time because I'm going to go ahead and register. I'm going to get the seat I want at the testing center and location that I want. And then once I know I have my seat, then I, I can begin, you know, my schedule for my start of my prep. And, but that ultimately means that a few semesters before that, you had to make sure that your schooling was in line, that you were going to have the time to do it. So it's, it's all about looking ahead and, and planning ahead. And, and I always get very excited when we go to conferences like Davis and we see sophomores who are eager to learn as a sophomore freshman. I try not to scare them too much, <laughs> <laughs> too much. Um, but sophomores, I'm always, you know, very eager to make sure that they understand this is kind of the key time for, you No, you don't have to do anything yet. That's the good news. I'm not asking you to prep yet. But I'm asking you to start paying very close attention to your course load and your planning and getting everything kind of in line so that, yes, if you want to follow that guide of making sure I'm going to be in the center I want, I'm going to be taking it early, I'm going to get my application in early, that all of your ducks are in a row and that you can just march right through. Now, again, my advice to any student would be, if a hiccup happens along the way, because life is full of hiccups and we all get them, if a hiccup happens along the way and maybe you have to repeat a class or maybe you wind up starting and realizing this semester isn't going to work for prep, just take a deep breath, talk to your advisor. You can call and talk to us at Exam Crackers. We do consultations all the time. We'll walk you through it. And if that means kind of pulling back and setting your application for the next year, then you just follow all of those amazing guidelines. You're just following them one year later instead of the year that you're in. It's, it's, it is definitely something that I feel students need to have a guideline and have a structure, but also understand that life can happen. It can happen to all of us. And if that means adjustments have to be made, okay, adjustments have to be made and, and everyone will still keep moving along. Yeah. And it's just a year or two years. It's just three a year. Years. Yeah. Right. And, and I can tell you, and you know, Ryan, you may have personal experience, not personal experience, but uh, know people with personal experience. I interview medical students all the time. They teach for us. So I'm constantly talking to medical students. And out of the hundreds and hundreds that I have talked to and interviewed and hired and worked with, I would say probably at least maybe half of them took a gap year for one reason or another. Maybe they did it intentionally. Maybe they were forced to, but they took one. Out of those who took them, I have never had a single person say that they regretted their mm -hmm. gap year, ever. It was, it's either I, I needed that time and I just didn't know that I needed it. Or it was, I didn't expect it, but it gave me the opportunity to do, you know, ABC. Um, and that was even more beneficial for me in the long run. Or, you know, I got to hang out by the beach and work at Chili's for a summer and then jump into medical school and freak myself out. So, you know, it was, it, I've never had anyone say it was a bad thing. Is it for everybody? No, of course not. But I've never had anyone say it's a bad thing. It's 365 days. And like I said, medical school will still be there. Yeah. Very interesting timelines and prepping what other misconceptions are out there well i think one of the ones i hear all the time again probably the majority because of the industry that i'm in as someone who works for exam crackers test prep is it's all the same like i just need to get i just need to get some hands on you know my my hands on some books it's all it's all the same 
And of course, my first piece of advice would be it is absolutely not all the same. And it is just as much a responsibility of the student to do their homework and do their research and really determine who it is that they're going to work with. As, as we said before, you want to take this test once and be done. And in order to do that, you have to make sure that you connect with the prep material that you're working with. And that, I know that sounds a little hippy dippy <laughs> and kind of a, um, you know, uh, Peace child, but it's it, it you you have to make sure that the way the material is being presented to you, that the way that you are processing through it ultimately works for you as a student and is going to get you to the score that you're looking for. And as test prep companies go, there's a lot of us out there, but we all have very unique and very different ways of approaching this exam. Um, and I like to say, Personally, you know, there's a little bit of, of everything out there. So some must work for other students. One must work for some and one must work for another. At Exam Crackers, we like to think that we work for everybody. But, you know, it, it is what it is. And, and getting your hands on the material and really determining, is this going to be something that I'm going to connect with and it's ultimately going to get me where I want to be uh, in the long run is is where you're going to get your score from. If you, no matter where you start, or let me put it this way, no matter what you decide to do with a test prep company, if you decide to do a class or if you decide to study on your own, if you decide to use their private tutoring, whatever you decide to do, the materials, the books that that company provides is where it all comes back to. That's their baseline. That's their, that's their approach to the MCAT. And if you ultimately don't connect with their material, it doesn't matter which branch of the tree you're on, it all comes back to that material and you have to connect with the way that they approach the MCAT. How is a, a student supposed to figure that out? If there's there's Next Step, Kaplan, Princeton Review, Exam Crackers, uh, Barron's and, and other books out there, are they supposed to just go yeah. buy them all and start reading and seeing which one they become oh. one with? Start, start their own MCAT library? Yeah. No, absolutely not. And actually, I would I would advise completely against that because then you get into a, a matter of com being completely overwhelmed by five million different books, and and that's a that's a really bad situation to be in as well. No, you want to to do your homework, do your research, go to pre med fairs, go to events. If you don't happen to have any, and, and talk. I'm sorry, I should finish that. Talk to the different companies that are out there. We're all typically always out there and happy. To, to talk to you and our materials are usually on the table. So you can kind of talk to us about your learning style, your teaching style, um, particularly at exam crackers. If you don't have a pre-med fair or an event that is near you, if you go to our website, there's a little button you can click that says free MCAT consultation. We'll give you a call. We'll talk it over for 15 minutes. We'll see if it's a good fit or not. And, and in particular, we're really looking to see if it's a good fit. We're not looking to sell you on what we have. We're looking to see, is this going to work for you or not based on what your situation is? Um, but then also talk to your advisors. Most advisors have a library of MCAT study books and their offices. Some of them do, some of them don't, but maybe they do. And if you can get your hands on the materials there, talk to friends. If you've got a friend who used Kaplan and a friend who used exam crackers, can I borrow a couple of your books? Can I check them out? And then visually kind of check out the different, the different materials. You'll, you'll see a very clear difference very quickly uh, in regards to the approach. Um, obviously talking to the different reps from the company, companies, I should say, um, you know, we're all going to tell you a little bit about how we approach it. Um, and I don't ever speak for the other companies, because it's not my place to speak for the other companies. But what I can say about exam crackers is what sets us apart, what makes us different as a company is that our goal is to make sure, obviously, that you're getting the MCAT score you want to. But the way we get you there is from an interdisciplinary lecture test review format. I mentioned it before. We've got you practicing from day one, and you're going to be practicing until day done. It's it's the way we approach the material. And we try to make it interesting. We try to make it engaging. Go, saying fun might be taking it one step too far, but we try to make it as engaging as we can. Our books are extremely colorful. They are extremely engaging. Our instructors are 
very interactive and excited to be there and almost more mentors than instructors in the classroom. It's, it's a dynamic teaching style that we aim for. Um, and we also aim to not overwhelm students. We're not going to ask you to go back and learn your entire undergraduate education. It's not necessary and you don't have time to do it anyway. We're going to ask you to learn the high points and really understand them in that critical thinking mode that is so key. So, you know, like I said, I, I can't speak for the other companies, but I can I can speak about exam crackers all day long, obviously. <laughs> but doing the research of where a company is coming from and how they are going to deliver the material to you. And then ultimately, if you can get your hands on the books, you know, go to Barnes and Noble. Most of us are in Barnes and Noble as well now. And you can, you know, I, I know it's not Amazon. I know it doesn't come to you in two days, but you can drive <laughs> to Barnes and Noble. You can get there in two minutes in. sometimes. I know and feel a book uh, in your hands and, and, you know, physically, physically see the material. It's mm -hmm. always keep in mind, this is something you're going to be looking at over and over and over again for a long period of time. And you want it to be something that you are going to at least be interested in looking at. Maybe you're not going to love it every night. I'll take that. That's fine. But at least be interested in looking at because you got a lot of time ahead of you studying for this exam. Yeah. A lot of students prep on their own. They go buy the books and they'll they'll study on their own. They Absolutely. whether whether or not they can afford a full course or they just think they can study on their own, want to study on their own. And and one of the missing pieces to that is if they're sitting in their room and trying to as they're flipping through their exam cracker books that and there's a concept that's just not clicking with them where they turn to is typically a Google search to try to figure something else out. And you guys have a new feature that I thought was really cool for a student who is self-studying and, and can't afford or doesn't want to take a big course or hire a tutor. You guys have your yeah. new hotline. Explain what that is. Yeah, absolutely. The hotline is one of our newest resources. It's, uh, I think, pretty amazing. I don't believe, I, well, not don't, don't believe, I believe it's unmatched anywhere else. Um, I don't think there's anyone else offering anything like it. It is online office hours with our instructors. That is the simplest way to put it down in terms. Basically, if you're studying, if you're a self-study student, or even if you're a student in a class, um, either way, the hotline is a nightly bookable session with our instructors. It's open from Monday through Thursday from nine to 11 Eastern Standard Time, so two hours a night. And you go in, you book your evening, you can do multiple evenings if you want to, you can do just one if you want to, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But you basically book your evening and you get open access to one of our instructors online in our online classroom for two hours. Um, it is an open-ended session, so you can come and go at any time during that two hours that you want to. You can come in and maybe you're the only person there uh, and you can monopolize their time for a little bit. If there's multiple students in the classroom in the same evening, then the instructors go kind of round robin with everybody answering a question. You go to the back of the queue and, and you can sit and listen to everybody else's questions if you want to. And learn from other people, or if you want to ignore them, you can certainly ignore them until it's your turn again, and then come back up again. But it is open access to our top MCAT instructors for content clarity and clarification. So best way that I usually like to use as an example, self-study student, and you're working through the week. And let's say each night of the week, you have a few things that you're just not connecting with. You're feeling like, I, I really wish I could get somebody to talk to. But as a self-study student, you don't have that. You don't have any teachers. You don't have anyone that you can go grab and say, answer this for me. So you, you kind of add everything up from the week. You keep good notes. You book yourself a hotline session for Thursday night. You get in there and you get all of that clarified on a two-hour session on Thursday night. And just keep working through it. And it's it's a phenomenal resource. And like I said, you can book one night at a time. Or if you feel like you want to use it for three or four multiple nights over the course of a week or two weeks or six months, you can you can book out nights as you go. And the most amazing thing is it's only $35 a night. So 
$35 for two hours worth of time with one of our instructors. It's, it's an unbelievable value. Now, is this, is, can a, can a student come and say, Hey, I was taking, uh, this full length exam from Kaplan and here's this question that I can't get. Can you help me with that? (laughs) So they are, our instructors are approved to answer any of our practice exams, our materials, exam crackers, practice exams, exam crackers, materials, and any of the AAMC's materials, data, data bank questions, practice exams, anything AAMC related or exam crackers related. Um, they cannot answer for other test prep companies materials. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, what are the the chances right now with a student calling in and and being alone with an instructor or or there being fifty other students? Do you do you do you cap? I guess is is one question that I want to know. And then um, what are maybe average callers? Yeah. So we we don't cap, or at least we don't cap yet, because it is a newer resource. So it's just recently been launched in the past few months. It's still taking off. Um, so it's still gaining some popularity. So the good news is right now, it's not as busy as we believe it is going to become Mm -hmm. in the long run. Uh, so averages I would say right now are usually between two to three students in a given evening. You know, we're not hitting giant numbers yet. I, hopefully that will come at some point and we (laughs) might decide to do a cap on it. But, um, right now it is staying, uh, on the smaller side, no guarantee. Obviously I do have to throw that out there. Yep. There could be 15 students in there. We we don't know. Um, the only caveat is we do ask that you book it a day in advance. We, you do have to book it out 24 hours in advance. So while it is almost immediate gratification, um, if you're working that night, you can't say, I want to jump in right now. You, you can jump in the next night, mm-hmm. but you just can't jump in um, that particular evening. Um, and then a lot of times, too, students don't stay for the full two hours. So even you may jump in at nine o'clock and there might be two or three students there, but by 10 o'clock there may only be one other because the others have asked their questions and they're gone. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, it it can vary at any point during that two hours, um, you know, depending on how long students stay for the evening. It's just like office hours in real life. You go and you hang out and you're like, I want alone time with the professor. I'm going to stay longer than everybody else. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. With the only difference being that, they will go question by question. So it would be like if you took offer hours currently and turned it into musical chairs yep. at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody had to come out of the office one at a time after one question was answered. But um, I think the nice thing too, is that they do keep the audio open while everyone else is working. So, you know, to me, I know as a student, ultimately I was one of those that I, I could never think of the question, but somebody else would think of it. And I would be like, Oh yes, I so wanted to know that. Yep. But I never thought of it on my own. And and you can. You can sit there and listen to the other questions and answer explanations. And it's an interactive online classroom. So it has um, it has a, a screen interface and the instructor is able to draw and give you examples and, you know, pull up screens if they need to to show examples. And it's a it's a really nice, nice platform. Okay, cool. Well, Janice, before we head out, is there anything else that you want to make sure the student knows about the MCAT or about exam crackers? Absolutely. Well, I would say what what I want students to know about the MCAT is that you can do it. I know I talk to students all the time who are either scared of this exam and I'm sure, Ryan, it's the same for you, they are terrified of the exam or they're having to do it again and they're a little disheartened by the first go-round. And I always like to start by saying, don't don't let those emotions or feelings eat you up. This exam is definitely doable, absolutely. And it's probably one of the biggest missions we have at Exam Crackers is that for you to know you can do this. It just takes the right tools and the right understanding and the right prep, and you will be in the spot that you are wanting to be in. Um, If you happen to be a student who just got your scores back recently and you're sitting in a tough spot, have your moment. You deserve it. Have it, wallow in it for a hot second, and then get out. Get out of that moment and set up a game plan and, you know, pedal to the metal, get it done. 
uh, because ultimately you can, you absolutely can get through this exam. So that, that would be my advice on the MCAT itself. It's not there to keep you out of medical school as much as it is there to make sure that you will succeed in medical school. And if you can just remind yourself of that every once in a while, it doesn't seem like such a big barrier to the ultimate goal in the long run. As far as exam crackers is concerned, uh, I want you to know that we are absolutely here for you as a pre-med student. As I mentioned, we have our free 15-minute consultations on the website at examcrackers.com. If you don't know what you're doing or you want to talk over your own particular situation, come set up a consultation. Let's talk. Let's figure out what's going on. Uh, Browse through our materials. We have amazing resources. We talked about the hotline. We have classes all over the country. We have amazing online classes. We have private tutoring, both online and in person. You name it, we do it. And we do it in a way that ultimately is going to make sure and ensure that you score the way you want to in the long run. And, you know, we we like to say we came into this market uh, roughly 20 years ago and basically changed the prep market. It was a very boring market (laughs) up until about 20 years ago. And then we came and kind of flipped it on its head and we put everything in color and we we had our little mascot, Salty, who runs around and throws out mnemonics and tips and tricks. And we made it colorful and we split up the chapters and everyone else has kind of followed suit in regards to the image of the way prep looks nowadays, but the inner content hasn't changed in regards to we still approach it in a very, very different way that ultimately connects with students and doesn't overwhelm them and ensures that they are ready for their MCAT. So I would hope that as you go through this process, you reach out, you give exam crackers a chance and a shot because we would love to see you knock your MCAT score out of the park. All right, so there you have it again, Janice from Exam Crackers talking about the misconceptions that pre-med students have when it comes to the MCAT. Now, during our discussion, we talked about Exam Crackers' new hotline, which if you're a self-studier or you're using a course and you need some more help, you're using some of the double AMC materials and you need some help answering some of the questions and you haven't had anywhere to turn, now you do. With 24 hours notice, go to examcrackers.com and click on the self-study tutoring and tests and then practice tests, video reviews, and hotline. It's kind of buried there. Uh, And then you can find the hotline session there and you click book a session. And it's $35 an hour normally, but for the first 30 students, the first 30 students, and there are seven or 8,000 of you that are going to listen to this pretty quickly, uh, for the first 30 students using the promo code EKMSHQ, you can save $10. So it'll be $25 for that hotline session. And you can use that code for those 30 people up to five times. So use the promo code EKMSHQ for $25 per session for the Exam Crackers Hotline, where you can go with one of their top instructors and get your questions answered. Whether you're using Exam Crackers or not, you can have your questions answered. All right, so that's it for today's episode. I hope that was helpful for you. Hopefully, based on what we talked about, you will avoid a lot of these common misconceptions that students have when it comes to the MCAT, which typically hurts a student's ability to do well on the MCAT, at least the first time they take it, until they learn, and then they do better the next time. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here on The Pre-Med Years. (laughs) 